This is Tony from Adafruit, and in this video, we're going to look at analog inputs and outputs with CircuitPython. So this is a follow-up to a previous video that I did last week on digital inputs and outputs with CircuitPython, and I'll put a link in the description below when this goes up on YouTube, so you can check that out. Uh, and I also, even before that, I did a bunch of videos on how to set up CircuitPython on Mac, Windows, and Chrome OS so that you can start developing and like load CircuitPython firmware onto a board like Circuit Playground Express, for example, something like this, or a board like the Gemma M0 board, which actually comes with CircuitPython on it. Uh, so those videos, and there'll be links in the description, you can check those out, are kind of the basis of how to get started with CircuitPython. And then I'm going through in, in deeper dive videos like this one to look at some of the different features and functionality like analog inputs and outputs. So this is a really good follow-up to the digital inputs and outputs video because I'll kind of show what the difference is between an analog input and output and like an analog signal in general, uh, how it compares to a digital signal, and then you'll see how to control those analog signals in CircuitPython. So we'll look at how to read an analog signal using the analog to digital converter that's built into a lot of chips like on Circuit Playground Express and even Gemma M0 has one. Uh, and then we'll look at how to create analog signals using two different methods. So the one is using hardware called a digital to analog converter. It's kind of the reverse of an analog to digital converter. So it's a way to create an analog signal from a digital microprocessor. Uh, and then we'll also look at something called PWM or pulse width modulation, where you can kind of fake an analog signal. So it's not a true analog signal, but for some devices like LEDs and even like a servo and a motor, things like that, uh, a PWM signal can actually approximate an analog signal uh, and actually give you that same functionality without a lot of complex hardware for it. So we'll dive in and we'll see how to use analog inputs and outputs on uh, Circuit Playground Express is what we're going to use for this video. Uh, but again, this should apply to all of the CircuitPython boards uh, or boards that can run CircuitPython. And if you're totally new to CircuitPython and MicroPython in general, like I said, check out the earlier videos that I linked to uh, in the description below. And those will give you a little bit more overview of what it is and uh, how to load it onto a board and get started with it. So let's dive in. We'll go to our main view here. And hopefully the Twitch gods are uh, with us today. I tried to do this Friday and the Twitch servers were down. So we're doing a little bit of a uh, different video or doing this at a different time. Anyways, uh, up in the upper right hand corner, I have this is Gemma M0 and this is Circuit Playground Express. This one's purple because it's a prototype board, uh, but it's exactly like the boards that you can buy right now. And if I pull up this page right here, this is actually the product page for uh, Circuit Playground Express board. So again, this is a board that runs Circuit Python, which is a version of MicroPython uh, that lets you program your board using the Python programming language. So you can control all the hardware and you can even connect to a Python prompt on the board, what we call a REPL, the read, evaluate, print loop. And you can just type in Python commands that run directly on the board, which is really nice because that's how I'm going to demonstrate some of the analog uh, signals we're going to look at. I'm just going to connect to the REPL and start reading those signals and generating signals directly from it. So you don't have to install like an editor or tool chain or things like that uh, to get started with this. So let's start out. Uh, I'll also mention, I'll put a link to this guide. This is an earlier guide that I did uh, for MicroPython. And this one talks about analog inputs and outputs. And big surprise, this video is actually, I'm just going to do the same exact information but tailored to CircuitPython. And there's a few small subtle differences, uh, but basically CircuitPython, like I said, is a version of MicroPython uh, where some of the APIs are different and simplified and a little bit easier uh, and some extra features and things too. Like a lot of these boards, like the SAMD21 uh, on the Circuit Playground Express right here shows up as a USB drive, for example. So it's really easy to edit files and things on here. Uh, but anyways, this guide is still useful to look at because it just gives you a little bit of overview of kind of what some of these analog inputs and uh, outputs are. Uh, but eventually you'll see versions of these guides also in our CircuitPython documentation that are CircuitPython specific. Uh, but anyways, this is what we're gonna start with. And so let's start with, uh, I figured I'd start with the analog to digital converter. So how you read an analog input. 
Uh, basically, if you have an analog signal, how you can capture that and take samples of it. Uh, and it's a neat little feature built into most microprocessors here. And there are a couple ways that I can demonstrate this. So the, the first thing I'm gonna start with is using uh, this little guy right here. So this is, if I hold up maybe to the camera right here, this is just a potentiometer. So there's a little knob on top right here. It's a variable resistor. So as I turn that knob on the top right here, it's just changing the resistance. And there are three pins uh, that are on this device. And so one pin, you can wire this up in a lot of ways, but basically the middle pin is called the wiper. And so it's the output effectively of the knob uh, and its resistance will change based on the position of the knob. And the nice thing is if you wire this up, so if one of the pins on the outside, like let's say this right pin, is connected to power, like 3.3 volts, and then if the far left pin, like the third pin, uh, is connected to ground, then the middle pin actually acts as a voltage divider so that as that resistance changes, as you turn the knob, it will output a different voltage that's proportional to the resistance or the position of the knob. So you turn the knob all the way to the right, and you would get maybe the high 3.3 volt value. And then you turn it all the way to the left and you would get a zero volt or ground value. And then if you go in between, you get pretty much exactly halfway. So if you turn the knob to the halfway point, you get half of 3.3 volts. So like, you know, maybe 1.8 volts or something like that. Um, and that's really handy because you can take that voltage output from this potentiometer and feed it into your board, into the analog to digital converter that's built into your board. Uh, and then you can read that value. And so this is a big difference from the previous video I did on digital inputs and outputs, where you saw how to read a digital input like a push button. So you push the button, you connect uh, the button basically to like maybe a high voltage or low voltage, and then you can read, is it at a high level or a low level? Is it at 3.3 volts or is it at ground? It's either one of those two states, but it's nothing in between. Uh, that's what a digital signal is. For an analog signal though, we actually can look at, okay, what is that signal in between ground and 3.3 volts or five volts or you know some arbitrary uh, limit there? You know, it could be one volt, could be two volts, could be negative 10 volts in some cases. You know, you could be all over the place uh, reference to ground. And so that's the big difference is that an analog signal is just a continuous signal that can be any value uh, between you know some, uh, there's technically no limit really. I mean, you, you could, try to read very high voltages, you might damage your board. Uh, but you're looking at something that's not just on off, it's not just zero or 3.3 volts, it's anywhere in between there. Uh, and so you need to use that special hardware, like I mentioned, built into your chip to read that voltage because your processor, uh, your CPU, really only knows how to deal with digital signals. It really just knows a one or a zero, an on or an off, or true or a false. In order to read these analog signals, it has to use some special hardware uh, that does a lot of fancy things to take that analog value and convert it into a digital value because that's what your microprocessor can deal with. So it can take, for example, that voltage that's being output by your potentiometer, let's say it's like one volt, uh, and then it knows how to convert that into a numeric value that you can read um, that's proportional to other values. So for example, maybe if I double that voltage from one to two volts, then my analog to digital converter would give me a value that's maybe twice as high or you know some proportional value higher than that. And so I can map that value I get from my analog to digital converter back to a voltage value if I want so I can know what voltage this is. Um, so we'll start with the potentiometer, but then I'll, I'll mention a couple other interesting things that you can connect this to because there are a lot of devices that have an analog signal or an analog output. Uh, sensors in particular, like maybe a thermistor, like a thermometer or light sensor, for example, a lot of different devices will change their resistance based on something they're sensing, like temperature or light. Uh, and if you change resistance, you can wire things up in a certain way, like I mentioned, using a voltage divider, um, so that you can actually turn that change in resistance into a change in voltage. And then once you have a change in voltage, you feed that into your analog to digital converter, and you're able to read that as a digital value on your microprocessor, and then reason about it, and write maybe a program that says, okay, you know, once my light sensor gets above some threshold, then maybe I know you've turned the lights on in the room. Or if maybe my temperature sensor gets below a certain threshold, then you know, maybe the, the grill that I'm monitoring is getting too cold, and you know, it's not gonna cook the, the food the way I expected. So those are a couple examples, but let's just start with this potentiometer, because it's really nice in that you can just directly control it. I'll just twist the knob, and we'll see how the voltage changes here. So let's start with wiring up this potentiometer. Um, and I have this, I'm gonna wire it up to a breadboard. Like I said, we're gonna start with the uh, Circuit Playground Express board right here. And then uh, I'll show how to connect a few different things to it. 
So I have a little breadboard here just because it's gonna make it easier to connect to Circuit Playground Express uh, because it has all these little pads on the outside and it's really easy to connect uh, little alligator clips like this to the pads on the outside. Uh, but to connect these alligator clips to this tiny little potentiometer, you can see those three little legs, uh, it's a little bit hard. So it's easier if I put this into a breadboard like this uh, and then I'm able to break out, oops, let me make sure I line it up the correct way and plug it in like that. Uh, there we go, yep. Uh, so anyways, this makes it easier so I can connect it to my Circuit Playground Express board right here. And like I mentioned, the potentiometer has three outputs. Um, and you can see there's uh, there's th three pins, that these three wires are each connected to one of the pins. And this red one right here, I'm gonna connect to 3.3 volts. So one of the outside pins, so you know, there's one pin on the left here and one pin on the right here that's an outside pin. And then there's one pin in the middle. And so that middle one is special. You could use either one of these pins. It doesn't really matter. One of them has to be connected to 3.3 volts and the other one has to be connected to ground uh, because that's gonna give you your range of voltages that you're feeding into this. So let me just wire up real fast with these alligator clips. Oops. Okay, so we'll wire up the 3.3 volts and I'm gonna connect that to the 3.3 volt output on Circuit Playground Express right there. There we go. And then let's wire up the ground one next. So we'll do this. And we'll wire that up to a ground output. Maybe we'll pick the one up here. Uh, you do want to be careful. Don't uh, don't let these two touch each other. Uh, your ground and your your power. Keep these away from each other because if they touch each other, then you'll short them out, uh, which may damage your board. So you don't want to do that. Now the middle one, that one's special. So like I said, that's the wiper. That's basically your output of your potentiometer, and it's going to change its resistance. Uh, and the, because of the way I've wired this up, it's also going to change the voltage that's being output out of here. Uh, and so what I want to do is I want to feed this into an analog input on the board. And so you want to check your board's documentation to see which of the pins are analog inputs. On this board, it actually has labeled. So there's like A0, A1, uh, different analog pins that I can connect to. So I'm going to connect to, uh, connect to A1 on this board. Uh, but other boards, you know, for example, if you're using a Metro board, for example, um, you know, you might have to wire that up a different way. Um, the Metro board has like a header, uh, female headers that you have to plug wires into, for example. Um, for this. Okay, so that's, I've got it wired up and then let me plug in the board to my computer. And I've already got CircuitPython loaded on this board. Um, I believe it's running the 1.0 version right now um, of it. And like I said, check out the videos um, that I mentioned. I did three videos on, one on Windows, Mac OS 10, and Chrome OS on how to load CircuitPython and how to set up like an editor uh, to control it. And also how to access the serial REPL because that's what I'm gonna access now. So we're gonna look at the, we'll connect to the Python terminal effectively on this board. Uh, so first let me just list on my Mac all the serial devices, uh, all the USB serial devices rather. Um, okay, so this is my circuit playground board and I'm gonna use the screen command to connect to that. So the USB modem um, 1411. And then I wanna use 115200 baud. This is just the standard baud rate that you need to use to connect to the serial REPL. And okay, so I've connected to my board and basically it's in uh, this state where it's just waiting for a main.py to either be modified or copied to the board. But I'm just gonna use the serial REPL to kind of explore this analog input. Uh, so I'm gonna press enter just to enter the REPL mode like this. Uh, okay, so at this point now I'm ready to start using the analog inputs on this board. And I'll show you um, a link to the CircuitPython API documentation. So this is really handy, good info to check out. And it's the analog I.O. module that we want to look at in particular here. So in the analog I.O. module, there is an analog in class. And this is what I want to use to read from the digital to analog converter on this board. Uh, and so you'll see there's kind of a real simple way to use this device. It basically just has, you create an instance of the analog in class. You need to tell it which pin that you have uh, that you want to read your analog input from. Uh, and then you really just want to look at the value property. Uh, there's also a reference voltage uh, that you can look at, but value is going to give you the numeric value that's taken that analog signal and converted it into a digital value here. So we'll see how to use this um, in a second here. So first I need to import the board module. And if you saw the digital IO video that I did before, the board module is how you reference all of the pins that are on the outside of this board. So like that A1 pin that I've connected it to, uh, I need to reference that in a certain way. And so I have to reference that from the board module. And then I want to import the analog IO module. Uh, oops, analog IO module. 
Uh, and then that allows me to access that analog in class that I just mentioned. Um, and at this point, I'm ready to read from this input. So let's just call this a0 equals analog IO. Uh, that's, I have to reference the module that I just imported. And I want to create an instance of the analog in class. And then I need to pass it an instance of the pin that I want to use. And so I'm going to use the board.a0 pin. Uh, and back in the digital IO video, I kind of mentioned you can list all of the pins that are in that board module using the dir command. Uh, so you can see, you know, what's the actual name that you need to use to reference these. Um, okay, so I do that, and that's pretty much it as far as like initializing and setting up an analog input. Uh, at this point, I just call a0.value. So there's a property on this object called dot value, and that's going to return the value from the analog to digital converter. And if I call this a few times, well, you'll notice the value changes a little bit. Um, it is kind of interesting that it's, it's kind of going up and down a little bit. Um, just want to make sure I have my connections here nice and well connected. Okay, yeah, I'm just making sure it's not shorting out or doing anything too crazy uh, like this. Interesting that it keeps going up. That's very, that's that's a little interesting. I, I don't expect to see that behavior, to be honest. Uh, but let's see, let me change the knob here and we should hopefully see, oh wow, something, this is this is quite interesting. So this is, this is not, not working the way that I expected here. So I'm reading value and I seem to be getting a, a monotonically increasing value. Oh. I think I, ah, I know why. Uh, I just made a, a, an interesting mistake that I'm sure a lot of other people will make too. Uh, so I just read the A0 pin when I actually have the A1 pin connected. So maybe I'll just say I meant to do this. So what I'm doing is I'm reading an analog input that I don't have anything connected to right now. It's the A0 pin right here. It's like totally disconnected. So we're just seeing weird random noise fluctuations. Uh, you know, this is, it just happens to be increasing. Let's see what happens if I touch it. It's probably, okay, yeah, look at that. It goes way down when I touch it. Um, so word of the wise, make sure you get your inputs correct. And if you start seeing strange values, maybe step back and say, okay, is everything connected the way I expect? So let's try this one more time. Let's do A1 equals analog IO dot analog in. And I want board dot A1 now. That's the input that I want to use for this. Okay, now let's see what happens when I do A1 dot value. Hopefully we get something that's a little more stable than that. Uh, okay, so we get like 35, 198. Okay, this is looking pretty good to me. So I have the, the knob kind of turned into the, like the halfway position right now. You can see it's kind of facing straight up and that's halfway. If I go all the way to the right, that's uh, going to be all the way to 3.3 volts. And if I go all the way to the left, it's going to be all the way down to ground right here. Um, but you can see at this halfway position, I'm getting kind of a value of like 35,000. And then if I turn it all the way to the right like this, now I get a value that's like almost 65,000. And then if I turn it all the way to the left like this, then I'm going to get a value that's pretty close to zero. It's not going to go all the way down to zero, but it's it's pretty darn close to that. Uh, and so that's kind of cool. And then as I change the knob, so I'm going to turn it back into the halfway position, I'm going to get a value that's you know around that 35,000 value um, like that. And I'll show you some other interesting thing here too. So I'm going to use my multimeter, and I'll connect the multimeter to read the voltage that's being output by the potentiometer. So what I'll do is I'll connect um, the, the voltage uh, reading uh, end of this probe to the output of the potentiometer. So let me connect this red wire right here to the potentiometer. And then I also need to connect the ground of my multimeter so I can make sure to read this correctly. And I will hopefully be able to show you, let's see if I can get all three of these. We'll zoom this out a little bit wider. There we go, that should hopefully be readable. There we go. So my multimeter is showing voltage. Uh, it's, it's just in volts, so you can see it's like 1.8 volts right now. You can kind of see there's a, the decimal point is right there. Um, okay, so let's see what happens then. Again, uh, I'm gonna twist the knob all the way to the right, and let's see what happens. Oh, we see, got a little bit of glare right there like that. Let me see if I can move that out of the way a little bit. Okay, so I just twisted the knob all the way to the right, and you can see it's reading a value of like 3.309 volts. And when I call this a1.value, I'm getting a value of like 65,000. Um, you know, it's pretty close to 65.535 is kind of the maximum. Um, but notice that's at the, the one extreme with 3.3 volts. And then let's go all the way back down to the, the far left that I can go with the potentiometer. And now I'm reading pretty close to zero volt. It's not exactly, it's 0.001 volts. Um, so it's close to zero, but not exactly there. And when I call a1.value, I get a really low value. Um, you know, something that's down like the 50s and 60s like this. 
And if I just twist the knob a little bit, again, I'll go into the halfway position. Um, you know, I can get any voltage in between zero and 3.3 volts. Um, and it really, it, there's an infinite range of voltages here that I could get uh, if I wanted. Uh, you know, it just depends on how precise of an instrument I'm using to measure them. But if I want, you know, here's 1.3 volts, but let, let's go for 1.4 volts. You know, that let's see if I can get exactly 1.4 volts. It's a little bit hard because um, the potentiometer, you know, it, it's a tiny little device and a, a small little change in movement just very slightly changes the resistance. I think this is probably about as close as 1.4 as I can get. I'm just very slightly trying to twist the knob. Uh, that's 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 pretty close, you know. Don't breathe. It's it's almost 1.4. Uh, but when I call a1.value, I'm getting a value of 27,000, which that's proportionally, uh, you know, it's less than 35,000 because you know in the middle I was seeing a value of around 35,000, but you know in the middle I was at 1.8ish volts, but now I'm at 1.4 volts, and so I'm getting a value of 27,000. Now you might be wondering, like, what does that number actually mean? What is that 27,000? Um, so if you look at the description for value. What the analog to digital converter is doing is it's taking that voltage and that voltage falls within a range. And that range is based on ground at one end, the zero volt. And then at the top end is your analog reference voltage, which is usually fixed by your development board. Like you usually can't change that. On some boards you can. Uh, on some Arduinos you can actually feed in a specific voltage, I think up to like five volts, uh, that, that becomes your analog reference. So for example, if you had a sensor that maybe output something within the range of like zero to one volts uh, or zero to one volt, you could set your analog range to be zero to one volt. Use that analog reference of one volt. So that way you have this maximum amount of precision. Every little bit of your analog to digital converter is used to look within that zero to one volt range. Uh, so that you know just a small little change will actually be measurable. Whereas you know you could set that analog reference to 10 volts, you could still feed in that zero to one volt signal, but you have a much wider range. And so the thing with an analog to digital converter is that it's limited by its precision uh, by the number of bits that your analog to digital converter uses. So uh, on an Arduino, like an old 18 mega uh, Arduino, it's a 10 bit analog to, to digital converter, uh, which means that you can only read like 1024 values effectively. It's like 1024 different voltages. So, you know, you could take that zero to 10 volt range, divide it by 1024, and those are the buckets that you can see. So, you know, you can see maybe, uh, let's see, like you had a 10 volt range divided by a thousand. So you could see, I don't know, maybe like a 10th of a volt or something like that. Um, whereas if you restrict that range to just one volt, then you can take all 1024 of those buckets and divide up that one volt range. So now, you know, you can see like a hundredth or a thousandth of a volt in some cases. So you get much smaller precision, but over a uh, smaller range in that case. Um, so it's, uh, it's a trade-off that you have to deal with in a lot of cases with these analog signals. Now for this board, and again, you want to look at your board's documentation because each microprocessor is usually a little bit different. Uh, this one supports, if I remember correctly, a 12-bit analog to digital converter. So it gets values in the range of zero to 4,095. Um, but the one thing with CircuitPython that it does is it tries to normalize uh, a lot of those outputs of your analog to digital converter. So on some chips, you know, you might have a really super fancy analog to digital converter. Maybe it gives you like 24 bits of accuracy and precision. You probably pay a lot of money for that microprocessor. Um, whereas, you know, a simple little chip like this little Circuit Playground Express board, um, you know, much more low cost. So it only has a 12 bit analog to digital converter, for example. Uh, and the nice thing is if we just normalize all of those within a fixed bit range, like let's say 16 bits, then it makes your code a little bit simpler so that if you want to read an analog value, you don't have to go and change all of your code so that if it runs on a 24 bit analog to digital converter uh, versus a 12 bit or a 10 bit one, you know, suddenly all of your values are completely different and you have to change your code. Uh, so we'll normalize everything to be within the 16 bit range. And so that's what the description for value mentions here. And that's what this value is that's coming back here. It's just a number that goes from zero to 65,535, which seems like an arbitrary number, but that's the maximum value that a 16 bit unsigned uh, integer can represent. So if you do the binary math on that, you can figure out 65,535 is the max value. So if I ever call a1.value and if I ever get back 65,535, then I know this analog signal that's being input to my board 
is at or maybe even above uh, because on some boards when when the in, when the input voltage goes above your reference voltage you just get that maximum value but if i get that 65535 value then i know i'm seeing the maximum analog signal you know it's 3.3 volts or it's 5 volts or it's whatever my reference voltage is uh, for this board and so i can get pretty close to that when i turn this potentiometer knob all the way to the right and again you can see i'm reading 3.3 volts right here you're getting 65407 you know that that's close enough to 65535 uh for me you know it's if i call this a few times i'm still getting pretty close to that like this potentiometer is uh you know as i twist it all the way to the right it's an analog device you know i might not be twisting it exactly far enough to get all the way to that extreme like there's still a little bit of resistance there's a little bit of resistance in these wires that's maybe going to cut that voltage down a teeny bit uh, but this is pretty close to that maximum value that i expected uh, and again, you'll always get back a positive value. So it's going to be from 0 to 65535. So if I go down to that 0 volt value uh, again, then you can see my analog value falls down to a value that's kind of near that 0. So I should never see like a negative value um, from this. But it's, you know, I can know, okay, I see a small value, so I must be close to that small voltage value uh, like that. Um, okay, so that's the basics of an analog input. So you feed an analog signal into one of your analog inputs on your board, uh, and then based on your board's reference voltage uh, that you might need to look up, and it looks like you can actually call. So if I call a1.referenceVoltage, uh, that's gonna tell me what my reference voltage is, so it's 3.3 volts basically. Um, and so then I can tell, okay, if I get a value at 65535, then I know I must be getting 3.3 uh, volts back from my signal. And if I get something in between there, then it's somewhere in between that reference voltage uh, that's proportional to that. Uh, and if I wanted to, I could actually convert this to a voltage value. So if I just take my A1 dot value, and if I divide that by 65535, so that's going to give me, you know, I'm going to divide it by the maximum. So this is going to give me a value that falls within the range of 0 to 1. And the nice thing is, in Python, division, in, in MicroPython and CircuitPython, division by default is floating point. So I don't have to actually say zero, uh, point 0. You know, if you, if you did this kind of command in Arduino or C with this exact syntax, you'd actually get a, an integer value, which you may not want. I actually want a floating point value. So if I take this, I take a1.value divided by 65535, and if I multiply this by the reference uh, voltage, a1 dot reference voltage, then this should actually tell me what is the voltage that's being input to this analog to digital converter. So let, let's actually turn the knob up to a, a value that makes a little more sense to read. Let's see if I can get to like one volt. Let's see if I can get really close to one volt. Oh, that's pretty darn, hey, look at that. Okay, don't breathe. Oh, uh, there we go, <laughs> we're really close to one volt. All right, so I'm gonna hit enter. Check that out. It's This is basically converting to that one volt value, you can see. I'm getting a value like 0 0.99. You know, that's close enough to one volt for me. Um, so if you're curious, if you want to actually convert your input into that voltage, this is a simple little equation you can use to do that um, in this case. And like I mentioned, there are other devices that you might want to use that have uh, analog inputs or analog outputs. So this is a little photo cell, a little CDS photo cell, um, super, super common little thing. Uh, there's actually one built into the Circuit Playground board. Uh, it's the, looks like it's the A8 input right there. So that little photo cell. Uh, and again, this is an analog device. Uh, this has two wires. Uh, and the way that you would wire this up is you need to add a resistor to it to make a voltage divider. We actually have a whole guide on how to wire up uh, a photo cell and use it with Arduino. And that uh, the, the same exact wire, wiring would apply to uh, CircuitPython and MicroPython. But then you would use the exact same code that I just showed to read this as an analog input. And the cool thing about this sensor is, depending on the amount of light that's hitting it, it changes its resistance, which changes its voltage, like you'd see from your multimeter and in your analog to digital converter. Uh, so if it gets really bright, it has a different voltage versus if you know if you cover it up with your hand, and or maybe a, lunar, a solar eclipse covers it up and there's no light anymore, then it would be able to uh, detect the change in that. Uh, another really interesting thing is something like this. This is a thermistor, and this one's connected to a long wire. Uh, but basically, you know, it doesn't look very fancy, but at the end of this is a resistor that changes its resistance based on the temperature. So if I drop this into a hot cup of coffee, uh, then it would change its resistance, and when I pull it out, it would be a different resistance, and I can actually tell. There's actually an equation that you can use to convert the resistance of a thermistor into an exact 
temperature value in like Celsius or Fahrenheit, uh, which is pretty cool. And these are pretty inexpensive, just uh, I think a couple bucks for a thermistor like this. And there's also one built into the Circuit Playground Express board. Uh, looks like it's the A9 um, value there. But again, both the thermistor and the light sensor on Circuit Playground Express, they're just connected to the analog to digital converter. So the internally, you know, we have simpler wrappers around them, but we will have some simpler wrappers to read those as voltages uh, or as uh, values like light and temperature. But it's just using this exact same analog to digital converter logic that you see right here internally. So it's just reading that value and converting from uh, the analog signal gets converted into a digital value, and then your code interprets that digital value in some way. So you know you can convert it into a voltage like this, or maybe you go further and convert the voltage from your thermistor into a temperature value. There's these equations called the steinhardt hart equations uh, that you can use to, to look at that. Okay, so that's how to read an analog input. Let's look at some analog outputs now. Uh, so I'm going to reconfigure things a little bit. So let's see, let's disconnect. Well, we'll keep the multimeter handy, but I'm going to disconnect the multimeter for now. Uh, and we'll come back. We'll use it in a second here. So let's disconnect that. And actually, let's just disconnect the whole uh, potentiometer. So we'll move this out of the way because we're not going to use it anymore. So we'll move that out of the way. And I thought I would start with, um, let's come back to, in the, the digital I.O. Uh, example, I showed how to uh, control an LED with a digital output. Uh, so that you can see here's an LED and this is just a little resistor that's connected to it. And if you go back to the digital IO video, uh, there'll, there'll be a link in the description. Uh, you can see how to turn this on or off. So you can have it full bright or totally off, uh, but there's no in between for it. So, you know, it's either on or off because it's a digital signal. There is no in between with the digital signal, but I can actually use an analog signal uh, a, a varying voltage, I can feed that into this LED to control its brightness effectively. So I can make it really bright or really dim just by changing the voltage that I feed into it. So rather than sending just a full 3.3 volt high digital logic level into it, I could send a halfway in between high and low, you know, like a 1.8 volt value into it, uh, which should light up the LED, you know, roughly half as bright. Uh, as if it had like a full 3.3 volt output for this. So, okay, so let's wire this up. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna connect, uh, oh, and my multimeter is mad that I haven't touched it. It, it really wants a lot of attention. So uh, let's see, we'll, we'll convert it in between the uh, analog to DC mode because I, I will show, it is so kind of handy. We'll see how to, we'll read the voltage that's being output by um, the, the board. So we'll see how you can control this voltage output. So like I said, there are a couple ways to create an analog signal. Uh, a proper way to do it is using a digital to analog converter, which is basically the reverse of the analog to digital converter that I mentioned. Uh, so analog to digital converter reads a digital value or reads an analog value and turns it into a digital value that your microcontroller can read. The digital to analog converter does the opposite. So you tell it a digital value, which is a value that falls within that range of zero to 65, 535. So you give it a value of like, let's say 35,000, like in between, halfway in between. And the digital analog converter, or DAC is sometimes DAC, sometimes how you, you abbreviate it. If you feed that 35,000 uh, number into it, it knows how to generate a voltage that's exactly halfway in between like that reference voltage range. So it would output a 1.8 volt value in that case. So let's do that. Let's wire this up. And this again is, um, it, it's not on every board. So you need to look at your board's documentation because digital to analog converters are actually somewhat uncommon, especially with Arduino uh, boards, uh, like the old AVR boards that you've used with Arduino, none of those actually have DACs or digital analog converters built into them. Uh, but it's these nice, these newer chips, the SAMD21 uh, that the Circuit Playground Express uses has a single digital to analog converter built into it. So we'll use that. And it's actually output on a special pin. And so there's a little squiggly line on the A0 pin right here. It's, it's probably too hard to read on the camera, but look, if you look at the board, there's a squiggly line in front of it. Uh, and that little squiggly line means that that's the DAC or the digital to analog converter output. And so I have to use that pin as my output. So, you know, I have multiple analog inputs, but I only have one analog output on this board using the DAC at least. Um, and so that's just, a, that's a constraint for the board because, you know, the, the DAC hardware doesn't come for free. You, you can't use it uh, with everything. So I'm gonna switch this white alligator clip to that A0 output.
And I'm going to connect that to, let's see, I want to connect this to the longer leg of this LED. So I just pulled the LED out. You can see the longer leg. Uh, that is the, uh, the cathode, if I remember correctly. Uh, and that's basically where I want to feed in the voltage. And then the shorter leg is the anode. And that's the one that I'm going to send down to ground. But I'm using the little resistor. This is a 560 ohm resistor. Like I mentioned in the digital I.O. video, anytime you wire up an LED to your board and you want to turn it on and off, you generally need to use a resistor to limit the amount of current through it. The exact value doesn't really matter. I remember when I was first getting started with electronics, you know, you, you just freak out and you're like, oh my God, I have to get the exact right resistor value. For an LED, it doesn't really matter that much uh, because this is just controlling the current. Uh, LEDs can live with a range of currents usually. I mean, again, don't use your $100 fancy LED without reading the data sheet to make sure that it falls within that uh, uh, the range of currents that it, it allows. But in general, use a 300 to like 1000 ohm resistor. Anything within that range is gonna limit the current enough that it shouldn't damage the LED or the board. Um, okay, so I have that wired up. And like I said, I'm gonna connect the A0 uh, pin to that longer leg of the LED. And then I'm gonna connect the shorter leg of the LED to one leg of the resistor. And then the other leg of the resistor, I'm gonna connect to the ground uh, from my board. So I'll just connect that up. And then I'm going to connect my multimeter just so we can see that voltage again, uh, because I want to look at the voltage output from my board. So I'm going to connect it to ground so that it can read. And then I'm also going to connect it to the long leg of the LED where I'm sending in that voltage value like that. So, okay, so now I'm going to read the voltage that's being output by that A0 pin. And right now the A0 pin is not initialized as a digital out or an analog output. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to reset my board because I just want to make sure that I'm back in a known good state. You know, I had started with that A0 pin as an analog input, uh, and sometimes you should, in theory, be able to switch between analog inputs and outputs. But just to be sure, I'm going to reset my board. So I'm going to press Control D. D is in dog. That just does a soft reset of my board, uh, and now I'm ready to go. And uh, surprise, surprise, the analog I/O module has an analog out class, and so you can see right here, this is the analog out class. And if I go to this, it just shows a quick little example. And it's basically the exact opposite of the analog in. So you initialize it, you point it at a pin. And again, remember, there's only a limited uh, set of pins. And on this board, there's only one pin you can use as an analog output. Uh, and then it has a value property. And this just expects a 16-bit unsigned value. And it will convert that value into a voltage output proportional to the value that you specify here. So let's set this up. Let's, uh, let's import the board module again, import analog IO, and let's set up my uh, A1 as analog IO dot analog out. And I'm gonna use the board dot A0 pin and make sure I get it right <laughs> this time. I think if I do A1, I'm pretty sure it'll give me an error. Um, well, let's see what happens, I'm kind of curious. Yep, see, okay, not supported. So if I made the mistake I made before and used the wrong pin, it, it warns me and tells me that, hey, that's not supported. Uh, now I'm gonna use A0, this is the correct pin that I have it wired up to. And okay, so at this point, uh, this should be configured so that when I change the value property, and I think I can actually read it, let's see what it has. Uh, oh, okay, I guess you can't read it. Uh, but when I change that value property, when I set it to a number in between zero and 65535, it's gonna set the voltage that's output. So you can see right now, it's outputting um, millivolts right now, but I'm gonna change the range. Let's put it in the voltage range. So it, this is like 0 0.017 volts. It's basically zero volts. It looks like it's outputting about ground right now. Uh, but let's change that. Let's do a1.value. Let's set it to the maximum, 65535, 65535. And let's see what happens here. Okay, check that out. I'm reading about 3.2 volts and the LED is it's pretty bright. You know, it's, it's definitely lit up. You can see it's, it's lit up like that. I'm not getting exactly 3.3 volts. Uh, and that just, again, depends on the range and there's like some resistance and the wires and things. So, you know, you're, you're not gonna get exactly the end of that range, uh, but that's kind of nice. So I'm seeing, you know, that, that max value. Let's set this to zero and see what happens. So if I set this down to zero, now I get, okay, I'm back down to like that 0 0.17 you know, millivolts, effectively zero volts. LED turns off, so that's good. So. Okay, a success, I've, I've basically approximated a digital output now. Let's go for an in-between value. So let's say, you know, this equals, how about 40,000, something like that. So, okay. So you can see I'm outputting two volts. Um, 
you can't really tell the LED it's not really lit right now you know it looks like two volts is not enough to actually turn this LED on um, but if I increase this a little bit let's say 50,000 something like that so okay now you can you might be able to tell there's a very slight glow to the LED and I'm at 2.5 volts now so you can see as I increase this value it's increasing the voltage and it's getting closer and closer to that 3.3 uh, volt maximum so let's go like 60,000 so now the LED is definitely brighter at that point and you can see I'm getting about three volts out um, like that so you know, it's pretty handy and then if I wanted I could set this to much lower voltage value this won't turn the LED on because an LED needs a minimum of you know usually around two volts or so before it even turns on and then beyond two volts uh, it might get a little bit brighter but if I set this down to like let's say 100 you know this should be really close to zero volts so this is like you know 0 0.005 volts uh, you know let's set this to maybe a thousand and see what happens so you know now I'm up to like maybe uh, you know 0 0.05 volts so it's getting a little bit higher but again the LED won't turn on because there's a minimum voltage you have to pass through it for it to turn on but that's you know effectively just again think back to that analog input you know this is the reverse of it I'm just controlling this value I'm sending in a number that goes from zero to 65,000 which might seem arbitrary and weird but uh, you know when you're down at the, a lower level of talking to your hardware like this usually you're dealing with integers and numbers like this uh, you know and if you wanted you could do a conversion so if I wanted to say I you know instead of specifying 65 535 as the maximum I just want to specify 0 to 1 and anything in between 0 to 1 uh, I want to map to that range uh, so that you know if I specify a value of 1 then I get that full 65 535 and if I specify a value of like 0 0.5 you know that gives me maybe halfway in between there so you can just use a simple equation to do that if I want to say like a1 dot value equals um, you know let's say my input is like 0 0.5 times 65535 so that's going to give me uh, oops uh, can't convert float to int oh that's kind of interesting so what's happening here is basically this math is outputting a floating point value because in Python uh, like here I can actually show you if I do 0 0.5 times 65535 that's giving me a floating point value there's a decimal here there's a fractional part to this um, for this analog input cloud or analog output um, it's expecting an integer so if I try to set a1 dot value equals you know 1.5 that's an error because this hardware doesn't know what 1.5 means it only knows 0 1 2 uh, and so you need to explicitly convert from that floating point value back into an integer value sometimes Python does this automatically for you um, but in this case there's a lower level C function um, that, that's being used here that basically doesn't do that in some cases so if I go back my equation in this case I actually want to add this int in front of it so I'm telling Python you know explicitly convert this into an integer value uh, and so that will set it to kind of a halfway voltage you can see I'm like 1.6 volts right there and if I wanted I could see the output if I just type you know if I put in that equation 65535 again like that so that's the value that's being passed into it 32,000 767 like that um, okay so that's the DAC the digital to analog converter uh, and that's just a way to generate an analog uh, value an, an analog voltage so you know a good example of something that might use this would be if you had a little speaker this is a tiny little speaker uh, that you can connect to your uh, board and so there, there are two wires here you know you connect this to one of your outputs um, and then uh, your ground for example this little buzzer and then based on the voltage that I pass into this uh, that changes how much the, the, the coil and the diaphragm and the, the speaker itself moves uh, and if I move the speaker over time then that creates a wave of pressure and that wave of pressure is actually what my ear interprets as sound so if I pass a signal in here an analog signal like a sine wave that's changing over time in a very continuous a very special way that's going to create a pressure wave that changes over time that I hear as a tone uh, for example so you you usually use an analog output in the context of generating a signal where you want to change that analog output over time and that's not usually the case that you're using an analog output to like dim an LED like this for example you certainly can but in most cases you're using your analog output to uh, control to generate a signal that changes over time so you might have a loop where you're reading audio samples because audio in like a wave file is stored as just a bunch of numbers which basically say okay for this moment in time 
uh, this number, you know, might be like 32,767, which means like, you know, okay, B, move your speaker halfway, uh, you know, into its middle position. And then the next sample might be a value that's like 65,000. It says, okay, now move your speaker diaphragm all the way out to the end. Uh, and the next value might be back to that uh, middle point so that, you know, that's kind of moving your speaker and causing that change. Uh, so that if you play that over and over, if you're reading that signal, if you're constantly reading different values and playing them back through your digital analog converter, then you're able to hear that as sound and audio. Uh, okay, so like I mentioned, that's one way to output an analog signal. Uh, another way is using something called PWM or pulse width modulation. And so this is kind of a way to approximate an analog signal. And the way it works is it uses a digital signal. So it's, it's only ever on or off, you know, it's on off. It's not actually generating an in-between voltage. Um, it's just only ever going to use 3.3 volts or zero volts. But if it turns, a, if, it, if it generates a signal that goes between 3.3 volts and zero volts really, really quickly, um, you know, if I'm just constantly going from 3.3 down to zero volts and back again, um, I can actually approximate a signal that's in between zero and 3.3 volts for some devices. So things like an LED, if I turn an LED on and off really fast, you know, if, if, if I do it kind of slow enough, like maybe, you know, once or twice a second, I can see that with my eye. But if I turn an LED on and off like 60 times a second or 100 times a second or 500 times a second, I can't really see that with my eye. It's just, it's happening so fast, my brain can't process that. Uh, but if I control how long it's turned on versus turned off during those little periods of time, then I can kind of approximate, you know, if during a little window of time, if I turn my LED on and off 500 times, uh, but if I leave it turned on more often than I leave it turned off, then it will, it will appear brighter to me uh, than if I let, leave it turned off more than I leave it turned on, you know, it would appear less bright to me in that case. Um, that's because, you know, my eye is kind of averaging out those very fast changes in the signal here. You know, it just sees that as a less bright LED because it's turned on uh, less often or less frequently. Uh, so this works for devices like LEDs. Uh, also some devices expect this PWM signal, this pulse width modulation signal uh, to drive them. So a little servo motor like this actually needs a special PWM or pulse width modulated signal in order to move the servo. It's kind of how it instructs it to move into a certain position is based on this special little signal that's generated here. Uh, I've actually done some videos on this in the past where I kind of dive in with, um, you can look with an oscilloscope. So I won't be able to see that signal with my multimeter because my multimeter is actually gonna average it out and it's gonna, it will hopefully see it will look like an in-between voltage, like 1.6 volts right here. Whereas in reality, if I hooked up my oscilloscope, I'd actually see it's this very fast changing digital signal where it's on and off for some proportional period of time. Um, okay, so let's do this. Let's, uh, we'll see, I think I can use this A0 pin as my PWM output. Um, but to do this, I need to use a different module. So it's not the analog IO module anymore. There's actually a, a pulse IO module. And we'll look more at a few of the other things uh, in a later video. There's a pulse input and output class, uh, but there's a PWM output. And so this is the pulse width modulation uh, output that I want to use here. So let's see, I'm going to reset my board again. I'm leaving it wired up exactly the same way. So A0 is connected to my LED, uh, just like I had it before with the digital analog converter. But I'm going to reset my board uh, just because I want to put it back in a default state. So I just press Control D, uh, D is in dog to reset this. And let's use my PWM uh, output to, to basically control this LED. And there's actually a little example here that we show uh, for this. So I need to enter the REPL again and import the board module, import the uh, pulse IO module now. And then I wanna create an instance of the PWM out class. So let's say my LED equals pulse IO dot uh, PWM out. And I need to tell it which pin I'm gonna be connected to. So this is the board.a0 pin. And I not every pin supports the PWM output. I forget exactly if this a0 pin supports it, but let, let's see, I think we throw a warning if it doesn't support it. So let's see if this supports, oh, hey, look at that, invalid pin. So let's move this over to the a1 pin. If I remember correctly, the a1 pin does support uh, the PWM output. So let's do a1, 
looks like that's supported. Uh, now there are other parameters to this and we'll come back to these in a second, but you can actually see this in the documentation. Uh, there's things like this duty cycle and frequency and all kinds of things that we can change. We're just gonna stick with the default value right now. We're gonna use this, uh, it's gonna use a frequency of 500, that's 500 Hertz. So it's gonna generate a pulse that changes 500 times a second. So that's really fast. That's faster than my eye can see for sure. Uh, but you can change that frequency. I could set this to, you know, like a servo motor usually wants like a 60 Hertz uh, pulse uh, frequency. Uh, whereas, you know, other devices might need a different frequency for this. Uh, but if it's me looking at an LED, anything more than like 50 or 60 times a second, you won't be able to see uh, that, that flickering with your eyes. Your camera might be able to though, your video, like if you're recording this, like my, my camera right here, we might see this thing actually flickering. Although with 500 Hertz, that's much faster than the, uh, my camera's uh, sampling probably like 30 or 60 times a second. So if I was only outputting uh, a PWM output with like maybe 30 times a second, my camera might kind of get in phase with that. And I'm, you know, I'd see like weird flickering or artifacts or things uh, from that. Anyways, so we'll stick with the defaults. Uh, and in this case, to change the, the voltage or to vary the output of this, again, I need to control what percent of time is the signal held at a high level versus held at a low level. Uh, and so I can control this by controlling what's called the duty cycle. And this is just percent of time that, it, that your signal is high or low. You know, my, my voltage is never actually gonna be in between. It's only ever gonna be 3.3 or zero volts, but because it's changing so quickly, um, you know, it's going to look like it's some in-between value based on the percentage of my duty cycle. Uh, and the duty cycle is actually an unsigned 16-bit value. So again, it's a value that ranges from 0 to 65535. And if I specify 65535, that means that my signal should be on all of the time and never off, which is basically just means turn on the LED full bright. So let's do that. Let's set my LED.duty cycle equals 65535, and let's see what happens. So, okay, this is looking pretty good. The LED just turned on, you can see it's pretty bright. And my, my multimeter is reading about 3.1 volts, um, which is interesting because, you know, you, you might just assume like, well, if the multimeter says it's 3.1 volts, it must be 3.1 volts uh, being output here. Uh, and again, like I said, if you hook this up to an oscilloscope, you'll see a very different story. You'll actually see that 500 time a second change. And actually, if I switch this into its frequency measurement mode, uh, which is over here, oh no, here it is, then we should actually see something interesting. I, I should be able to read the frequency uh, of this that it's changing. Maybe not. Uh, maybe it's not changing enough to, or well, I guess, it's not actually changing because my duty cycle, so it's just held at that constant high voltage value. But uh, well, well let, let's see what happens. Let's go back to voltage. We'll, we'll come back to that measurement because I'll be able to show that in a second. So, okay, so that's the maximum 65535 value. Let's go down to zero. So if I set zero, this means my signal will be off all the time. Uh, so I'm effectively turning the LED off like that. And you notice I get like a zero volt value inside of there. Uh, okay, now let's go to like a halfway value here. Let's go to, um, you know, we'll use my equation again. So we'll say 0 0.5 times 65535. So this is gonna say, I want half uh, of my range. I want half of a 3.3 of a, a volt range. So I do that and okay, so now you can see the LED is, it's a little bit brighter. Um, you know, it's, it's certainly not off, uh, but it's not the full intensity. And you might, I can kind of see it's flickering a little bit in the video uh, output, it seems like. So that's just some aliasing from the, uh, the camera. Notice I'm reading about like 1.6 volts. So, you know, the multimeter, again, you might think like, oh, it must be output, outputting 1.6 volts. But if you hooked up the oscilloscope, you would actually see that it is a very fast changing signal. And now I'll put it in, in the frequency measurement mode. And yeah, check this out. So this is, the multimeter is actually measuring the frequency of this changing signal. And it's telling me that it's 499.8 Hertz. Um, and there's no coincidence that it's reading 500 Hertz because that is the frequency. Uh, there's actually a property you can read on this. My, my PWM output is 500 Hertz. And so my multimeter is actually able to detect that. It, it knows that it's seeing a signal that's changing 500 times a second. But when I go back into that voltage reading mode, um, it's kind of averaging these things out. The way the multimeter works is when, when the multimeter sees a changing signal, uh, it will average it out so that it, it just looks at, you know, what is that kind of average voltage you're looking at? 
Um, but the, the signal has to change really quickly in order for uh, that to happen. Uh, so you can see that's how it works. But if I want to control the voltage of this, you know, again, if I want, like, let's say I want only a, a quarter brightness, so we'll say 0 0.25, um, you know, again, multiplied by that maximum 65535 value. So this will give me a quarter of 65535. Um, and so now my LED is about quarter brightness, and I see 0 0.7, 0 0.8 volts roughly. Uh, and then let's do like three quarters of, of brightness. So I do that, my LED gets brighter, I see a higher voltage, and then if I want, you know, we can go all the way to the max voltage, say 1.0 times 65535, and then boom, we're at full bright like that. So, uh, and again, so that's just another way to output an analog quote unquote signal. You know, we're, we're effectively approximating an analog output with this by, by using this digital output and changing it really quickly, changing it faster than whatever device it's connected to can actually uh, handle. And this LED, you know, if, if I was a superhuman, you know, maybe in the future, like replicants or who knows, uh, that have vision that, that can detect, you know, if, if I could see, uh, you know, maybe Wonder Woman or someone could see 500 times a second, she might look at this LED and see, oh, your LED is blinking quite fast. When I look at it though, I'm just a normal human and it just looks, you know, less bright to me when I look at it, something like that. Uh, whereas, you know, if someone was sensitive enough, maybe they could actually see that, oh, your LED is blinking 500 times a second and it's only on, you know, for this very small fraction of time versus uh, another small fraction of time. So anyways, uh, that's what I wanted to cover in this video is basically analog signals. So how to read an analog input like you might get from, oh, let's see, we looked at um, a potentiometer, like a little knob that you can change the resistance of, uh, but these are handy to also look at photocells, like a photosensitive resistor uh, or a thermistor, uh, a temperature sensitive uh, sensitive resistor. There are lots of other resistors. There are force sensitive resistors, like you can put into a shoe so that when you step or you put into a glove when you bend your fingers, that changes the resistance and you can measure that with an analog input, uh, for example. So like I said, most, uh, most sensors output an analog signal. Um, also another good thing to realize though, when you're reading sensors, in a lot of cases, uh, the analog to digital converter is only half of the story because that analog signal that you're outputting usually needs to be massaged into the range that your analog to digital converter expects. So like the analog to digital converter on this Circuit Playground Express board expects a signal within the range of like zero to 3.3 volts. If I had a sensor that output zero to 10 volts, I've got a problem. Like, you know, I need to convert that zero to 10 volt range into zero to 3.3 volts. So, you know, just realize if you if you get some really cool, fancy new sensor, uh, you might not be able to directly plug it into your board. You might need to look at what does my sensor output and what does my device expect to read. And you might have to change that. So there are certain circuits you can use like op amps that can change the, the range of values. Uh, that can kind of uh, control or you can you can change that analog signal So just realize that when you know you're getting into the analog world You sometimes have more complexity than just switching from you know in the digital world It's either on or off in the analog world It's in between and sometimes that in between is a wide range of values uh, for that Anyways, though, we saw how to use the analog to digital converter. We also saw how to generate uh, analog values or, or voltages using the digital to analog converter, which is just special hardware built into some boards. Uh, that, it's basically the opposite of the analog to digital converter. You give it a digital value and it outputs an analog voltage. And we saw that we could dim an LED by just changing that voltage value. And then I also showed how to look at a PWM or pulse width modulated output that basically uh, approximates a, a voltage by using a digital signal. It's only ever on or off but we're, we're changing that signal very quickly, faster than whatever device I'm connected to can kind of recognize. And then by controlling the percent of time that that signal is on versus off, I'm able to effectively average out, uh, you know, some in-between voltage value for that. So you saw I'm able to dim the LED based on changing the duty cycle of this PWM output uh, for this. And you saw just with a few lines of the CircuitPython code, just right in the interactive REPL, this is really the cool kind of power of this that you know, I can just experiment with this and see what does it mean to use a halfway value, you know, or three quarters of the way value like this. What what happens to the LED? Whereas if I want to do this in Arduino, you know, I'd have to like write a new sketch, upload it, see what happens. So this is kind of the cool power of, of Python uh, on hardware like this. So, okay, if folks have questions to uh, questions, throw them in the chat and I'll see if I can get to them. Uh, I'll switch back to the main view here.
uh, let's see. Oh, let's see. Someone's mentioning, yeah. So, uh, talk a little bit about like why the number of bits in the analog to digital converter is important. Yeah. So I mentioned before, like your analog to digital converter, it might have 12 bits. It might have 24 bits. Um, so that just controls what's the precision. The, the more bits you have, the higher the digital value your analog to digital converter can return. So like I mentioned before, uh, an Arduino has a 10-bit analog to digital converter. And if you do the binary math, a 10-bit number only gives you a value in the range of 0 to 1024. So that just means that I can only have 1024 unique voltages that I can measure. You know, even if I send in a voltage that's a teeny bit above another voltage, if it's not high enough to fall into that next uh, value or that next bucket, uh, you know, if it's not different enough, it's going to look like the same value. So it just means that I can't read very small values with a, a small analog to digital converter. Whereas if I go to like a 24 bit analog to digital converter, now I've got like 2 to the 24 minus 1. That's like probably well into the billions. I can't do that math in my head. Uh, but, you know, I'm guessing, you know, well over a billion different values you can probably read with that. That's way more than a thousand. So I have a much wider range so that if there's a very small change in voltage, that's probably going to jump, you know, maybe a few buckets up ahead and I'll be able to see that, oh yeah, that small little change is, you know, a significant number difference uh, from, you know, the, the previous value there. So the, the number of bits in your analog to digital converter just controls the precision or, you know, how accurate, uh, you know, what kind of values you can get back. Uh, and most boards have a 10 to 12 bit analog to digital converter. Um, usually if you want to get higher values like 16 bits or 24 bits, you need a separate piece of hardware, like a whole standalone chip that is just an analog to digital converter that then your chip would talk to over a protocol like I squared C or SPI. Uh, but yeah, again, it's a very important kind of distinction with analog to digital converters is looking at that, that bit range that they use. So uh, someone's wondering, is this live? Yes, this is live. Uh, yes. Grawlix is, uh, this is live. I will read your name so that you know for sure. Uh, this is definitely live. So, uh, and my cat's around. I don't know where she's at. So this, sometimes there's live internet cat fun, uh, but it looks like not right now. So uh, anyways, uh, that's, uh, it looks like that's all the questions. So I think I'll wrap up the stream. So anyways, like I said, this was uh, analog inputs and outputs with CircuitPython. Again, this is a follow-up to the digital inputs and output video. So look in the description below when this goes up on YouTube and you'll be able to see those previous videos. And there's a whole set of guides that are coming uh, in the very near future to look at these also uh, in a more text format. Uh, anyways, check out youtube.com slash Adafruit. You'll see this video and all kinds of other fun videos and projects. Uh, check out twitch.tv slash Adafruit. That's where I like to stream these videos live, uh, usually on Fridays, although it's not Friday today because I tried to stream this Friday and the Twitch server was down or my internet connection has problems or whatever, something was wrong, but it looks like it's all good now. Anyways, I like to do these live streams there, uh, but then the videos go up on YouTube later. So uh, check that out. If this is useful info, then click the like, the comment, the subscribe. Let us know that you're getting good value out of this content and we'll keep making stuff like this. Uh, and look forward to more of the CircuitPython kind of, I'd say, basics, although it's, you know, this really isn't basic info. This is just useful, good info on how to control hardware with CircuitPython. Uh, I think in the next videos, we'll probably start looking at some of the protocols, like talking to other hardware over I squared C and SPI protocols. So we'll see how to connect a uh, different board and then talk to that board, like maybe a little OLED display or maybe like a, uh, a sensor, like a digital sensor uh, that, that uses special protocol. So we'll look at more in detail uh, with the next videos on that. So until next time, this is Tony from Adafruit. Thanks a lot for watching. I'll see you later. Bye.